It's me, Miss McGregor. Joe Elliott. Come in. Well, what is it? Amy wanted I should come over to tell you she can't do the clothes this week. She stove up with cold. Oh, and she sent you ten miles just to tell me that. You know Amy. Once she's got something to say, she's going to say it now. <laughs> Besides, it only took about two hours the way I came. Good night. Good night, Joe. Tell her to take a hot lemonade and sweat it out. I will. Thank you. Good night. Good night. That flies to thy breast at one cherishing word. That folds its white wings, that a dreaming of flight. That tenderly sings there in loving delight. Oh, my sad heart keeps pining for one fond word. Call me that name, dearest. Oh, that was wonderful. Wasn't that wonderful? Like going to the theater for nothing. <laughs> what do you say, folks, if we organize a quartet right here? Mr. Calhoun will be the baritone, I'll carry the lead, Tom will be the tenor, all we need is a bass. How about you, Winthrop? Why, he couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. <laughs> Perhaps our new boarder, Mr. Bell, might do. Who, the professor? Our young genius. <laughs> <laughs> Bell's all right, just different. But do you suppose he really believes he can teach that deaf and dumb child he brought here to talk? All I can say is, if the Lord intended dumb people to talk, he'd have taken care of it. Oh, excuse me. Oh, come in, Mr. Bell. Mrs. McGregor, do you have any, any copper wire in the house? Uh, pic picture wire will do. Copper wire? Yes, I, I, I need about 17 feet for one of my experiments, and, and all the shops are closed at this hour. Why, well, the idea of expecting to find 17 feet of wire at this time of night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I never heard of such a thing, Mr. Bell. Well, I, I'm sorry if I bothered you. Good night. Well, just a moment, Professor. Don't think I'm impertinent, but we've just been wondering if it's true you can teach dumb people to talk. I hope to, someday. You see, Mr. Darcy, the reason deaf mutes can't speak is that they have bad ears and not, not bad vocal cords. Never having heard speech, they, they can't imitate it. So if we can find a way to, to visualize sound for them, then there's no reason why they shouldn't speak as well as any one of us, is there? No, I guess not. No. Of course not. Won't you stay and show us some of your tricks, Mr. Bell? Tricks? Yes, it'd be such fun. I've heard you can make the piano play by just talking to it. Oh, well, I'll be glad to, but they're, they're not tricks. Please. They're very simple manifestations of the, of the nature of sound and of, of vibrations in the air. Now, first, I push down the sustaining pedal. Then I depress the key. Do, do, re, mi, fa, so. Why, it's positively spooky. Oh, no, no, not at all, Mrs. McGregor. Sound is nothing but air in motion. When I sing the scales, I set up certain vibrations which fall on the strings of the piano just as they fall on the membranes of our ears, thus producing corresponding vibrations or sounds. Is that clear? No. Mr. Bell, the little boy's father's here to see you with another gentleman. Mr. Sanders, thank you. Excuse me, please. Mr. Bell, <laughs> that's a dandy act. I'll bet you could do something with it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Darcy. I expect to. Hello, Alec. Hello, Mr. Sanders. How is he? Just fine. I want you to meet my friend, Gardner Hubbard, Alexander Graham Bell. Mr. Hubbard, of course I know you by, by reputation. Your, your interest in the Clark School for the Deaf. I've been hearing about you, too, and your work with Sanders' boy. Would you like to go up and see George? That's what we came for. Please.
that's the multiple telegraph bell is working on. If it works, and I'm sure my theory is right, I ought to be able to send as many as 50 messages at a time over one wire. Get him interested, Alec, and your financial worries are over. He's the best organizer in Boston. Well, he's the man who brought gas to this town. Well, I'll be delighted to explain it to you, sir. You see, when I press this letter... Some here... other time, Mr. Bell, some other time. Right now, I'm more interested in what you're doing for Sanders' boy than I am in any newfangled invention. Oh, yes. We'll go right in. Excuse me. This way, please. May we see George? He's asleep, but I'm sure he'd want to see his father. Go ahead, sir. Shall I speak to him? I told him to shake hands with you. And he understood you? You saw what he did? Now I'm asking him if I should tell you how our glove works. We began by teaching him to spell simple words like C-A-T, and then showing him a cat. Now, by touching the letters, or, or rather combination of letters, I can talk to him as rapidly as I can to you. But I understood you were teaching him to actually speak. Watch this. <coughs> Have you ever succeeded in teaching a child that was born deaf to speak? No. And as far as I know, nobody else has. But I have great hopes. And Bell's still young, but he's had some mighty interesting experiences with sound and speech. Tell him about them, Alec. Well, uh, I come of a family that, that has made a professional study of the mechanism of speech for two generations before me. My grandfather, Alexander Bell, and my father, Alexander Melville Bell, were elocutionists who devoted their entire lives to the correction of defects of speech. Perhaps you've read some of their books on the subject. Well, from earliest childhood, I was trained to become a teacher of speech. That and the fact that my mother was deaf led me to my present interest in deaf mutes and, well, mute wires like the telegraph. Mr. Bell, I have a little girl of my own that I want you to work with. She had scarlet fever when she was four years old and it left her stone deaf. I've had her in Germany learning lip reading. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but uh, when I'm not working with George, I spend all my time working on my telegraph. Come over to supper Saturday night and we'll talk it over. Well, I hope you like beans, Boston baked beans. No, not much, and, and besides... You like I... the kind my cook prepares. Come on, Sanders, it's two and a half minutes past nine. Never mind, Alec. You'll have a fine chance to tell him about your telegraph instrument Saturday night. Suggest the sidewalk is no place for sleds. The sidewalk is very narrow. The ice makes one's footing very uncertain. You might have ruined the most important piece of electrical equipment in the city of Boston. Oh! 
I can excuse such behavior in children, but, but I, I don't well, think... What did you say? I said you are no longer a child, and, and that I, I think that... I'm sorry. Would you mind speaking a little more distinctly? Young lady, I come from a long line of elocution teachers. My grandfather and my father wrote textbooks on the subject. I think I know when I'm speaking distinctly. Good night. I, I'm sorry, but you see, I... The essential parts of both my transmitter and my receiver are these tuned reeds made of flattened steel clock springs, one end of which is attached to poles of these electromagnets, while the other end is free to vibrate over the other poles like this. Interesting, isn't it, dear? 626, Mother. Yes, dear, but I'm sure supper will be on time. The transmitter has make and break points. Ah, come in, my dear, come in. Mr. Bell, this is my little girl, Gertrude. Your little... Oh, but, but I, I thought... How do you do, Miss Hubbard? Very well, thank you. And these are my three other little girls, Berta, Mabel, and Grace. Mr. Bell. Good evening, my dear. Mm -hmm. How are you? Papa. Mr. Bell, this is the little girl I was telling you about. <laughs> Mr. Bell and I have already met, I believe. Met? What do you mean, met? He just got here. Well, I, I think I knocked him down. A and I'm awfully sorry if your... Well, whatever it was, was ruined. Oh, no, not at all. Mr. Bell makes things, dear. He was just telling us about his telegraph when you came in. I beg your pardon, Mama? His telegraph. Telegraph? That? <laughs> oh, please go on. Oh, yes, please We'd do. We'd love to hear about it. Well, I was just saying... When a spring sends its electrical tone into the wire, theoretically, only its mate and the receiver should respond. And if I set up a number of sets of springs tuned to different pitches, then I could send a similar number of messages over the same wire. I'm sorry if I said anything out there to offend you. But you didn't, of course not. And, and do go on. Well, that's about all. Except that it may not work. Oh, but it will work. I'm sure of that. Our supper is served, Mrs. Hubbard. Thank you, Nora. Nora, this is the third successive night. Supper's been late. I'm yes. sorry, dear. I'll speak to Cook. Go along, girls. Mr. Bell, supper. Uh, Mr. Bell, I hope you like beans. Uh, Boston baked beans. Didn't you think he had a very nice face? Who, Papa? You know very well I didn't mean Papa. Oh, then you mean Mr. Bell. Yes, of course. <laughs> Mr. Bell. Oh, I thought he looked all right. For a plain man. Didn't you think he had a nice nose? Well, it was awfully Roman or something. Oh, he has nice eyes, too. They blaze so when he talks. <laughs> I think you're in love, Mabel. <laughs> Oh, Gertie. May both in love. May both in love. Oh, Gertie. <laughs> he was advertising Papa and putting money in his telegram. Imagine Papa agreeing to pay for his experiment. <laughs> Mr. Bell's is the first voice I've ever really wanted to hear. Oh, darling, of course he's wonderful. He's marvelous. Do you think he'll like me, Gertie? Uh, I mean, even if I can't... Of course he will. That'll make him like you ten times as much. But he won't feel sorry for me. It won't be that, will it? Oh, no, of course not. Then I'm going to marry him. What? I'm going to marry him. I knew it the first time I saw him. I just made up my mind like that. But Papa... Oh, what will Papa say? I don't care what Papa says. I'll just close my eyes and then I won't be able to hear him. And besides, Papa mustn't know yet. Nobody must know yet. Only you. Oh, but you know how I am about secrets. I'll just die if I can't tell it. But you won't tell this, Gertie. You promise me you won't tell. Well, I won't if you promise to tell me everything he says and does. 
All right? All right, I promise. Shh, Papa. Gertrude, you and Mabel stop that foolish chatter. Don't you know it's exactly 11 minutes past 10. Put out the lights and go to bed. Yes, Papa. What did he say? He said to go to bed. Oh, all right, we'll go to bed. You know, if you hadn't married him, I would. Oh, Gertie. Gertie. Don't you love New England in the spring, Mr. Bell? Spring? Yes, it's very nice. We often come out here for picnics. Mother and father and... Well, all of us. You do? I'm sorry, Mr. Bell, but... You'll have to look at me or I can't see what you're saying. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Won't you tell me what's wrong? Wrong? Yes. Yes, you've hardly spoken a word to me since we started. H have I said or done anything to offend you? Oh, no, certainly not. Oh. It's just that, well, I've been thinking. Yes? You see, it may take years before I get anywhere with the telegraph, and I was just wondering whether or not I ought to go on with it. Go on with it? Suppose I don't want to wait. Suppose there are things I want to do now, while I'm young. Things I might do if I gave all my time to a regular position, like teaching at Boston University or something. What sort of things do you want, Mr. Bell? Oh, I don't know. A wife. A home. Finish your telegraph first. The wife will wait. She will? Oh, yes, Mr. Bell. I'm sure she will. Oh. Oh, thank you. But that's all I wanted to know. <laughs> oh, but, but there's something else I ought to tell you. Yes? I'm, I'm not as interested in the telegraph as I used to be. Y you're not? No. Ever since I went to Branford to visit my family last Christmas, I've had a new idea rattling around in my head. Either the biggest idea I've ever had in my life, or the craziest. Wouldn't you like to tell me about it? Well, I have an idea that if I could make a current of electricity vary in intensity, exactly as the air varies in density when sound passes through it, then, then I could transmit sound, even speech, telegraphically. Well, I'm sorry, but... I, I don't understand. I mean, I could talk through a wire. Talk through a wire? Yes, I, I could send a human voice as, as, as far as wires could be strung. Oh, but that doesn't seem possible. Oh, I, I can't believe it. It's talking through a wire. I guess it's crazy. When are you going to start work on it, Mr. Bell? Monday night. Oh. Thomas Watson, an electrician who makes all my apparatus for me, is moving in with me to help me. Oh, then, then you were really asking me for my endorsement and not my advice, huh? Something like that. <laughs> uh, Mr. Bell, if you spend all your time working on this, uh, how will you live? Oh, I'll, I'll manage somehow. But don't think I'm going to use the money your father lends me for anything but the telegraph. Oh, no. I'm going to work on this new idea in my spare time. Oh, yes. Yes, I understand. But, Mr. Bell, if I were you, I wouldn't tell my father about this yet. You, you see, he gets awfully upset if people don't finish what they start out to do. But couldn't this be our secret for a little while, anyway? Perhaps that would be. Why is it? And safer. Oh, much safer, Mr. Bell. Much. Eat it. Thank <laughs> you. 
Mother! Oh, Mother! Mabel, where on earth have you been? Oh, Mother, I've just been for the most glorious drive in the world. Oh, I'm so happy. Mm -hmm. Mabel, do you realize what time it is? You've missed your supper. Oh, please, Papa, don't scold me tonight. Not tonight. We've been worrying about you for hours. Something might have happened to your child. Oh. It's all right now, Gardner. It was all my fault, Mr. Hubbard. I talked so much, neither of us noticed the time. No. And, and finally, we had to stop under the street lights so, so I could see what he was saying. And the time just slipped by. Yes. Oh, Mother, Alec has such wonderful ideas. Alec? Alec? Uh, well, I, I... I mean Mr. Bell. Oh, no. Please call me Alec. Uh, all right. She called him Alec. <laughs> Mr. Bell, won't you stay and have something to eat? Oh, no, no, not now. I, I must be going. Good night, good night, Mrs. Hubbard. Good night. Good night, Mr. Hubbard. Good night. Good night. Good night, Alec. Good, good night. Good. good night, everybody. Come, dear, you must be hungry. Oh, I couldn't eat a thing. Not tonight, Mother. Good night. Good night, Papa. Gertrude! Gertrude! Call me, Tess. Hey, dearest, call me, Alex. The most exciting thing has just happened. Come on. Oh, my sad heart keeps pining for one kind word. Call me pet names, dearest, call me Alec. <laughs> pack, 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 the boys are packing. Cheer up, comrades, they will come. Ba, 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 ba. Careful, Watson, you'll break something. Good, then you'll have to buy more stuff for my boss. Listen, if it hadn't been for your boss overcharging me, we wouldn't have been turned out of here. Stop arguing. You'll get turned out of better places than this before you're through. You needn't bother packing your things, Mr. Bell. Nothing's leaving this house until I get my rent. You... you mean you're going to hold my things? The law gives me that right, and I certainly shall. But, Mrs. McGregor, I, I, I told you I'd send you your money as soon as I can. There's no use arguing. Out you go. But your things stay here. I won't leave them. I can't. I've got to have them. Oh, no, you don't. No, those things stay right here. Yeah, not, not, not that, not his vocal cords. Vocal cords? Yes, those belong to a Chinaman they've got pickled over at Harvard. Oh, heaven help us. Get it out of here. Get all this junk out of here. Junk? Did you say junk? Yes, junk. Get it out of my house. I'm sick and tired of seeing it around. You've had this place looking like a pigsty long enough. Get it out before I throw it out the window or burn it up. Mrs. McGregor, at this moment, I could almost kiss you. Don't you dare lay a hand on to me. To think that I have so misjudged you. In fact, I'll even give you the very shirt off of my back. Remove one garment and I'll have you arrested. Come on, before she changes her mind. Get that. Hello, Mr. Sanders. What's going on here? I'm leaving. Leaving? Yes, I, I'm taking George back to his grandmother's. I don't understand, Alec. You've taken my money, you've built up my hopes, and now you're walking out on my boy. Oh, I, I'm not walking out, sir. I'm, I'm being thrown out. But you had money. I paid you only last Thursday. And how Well, you... I, I, I used that for some new equipment. Then why didn't you ask me for an advance? Well, you, you don't understand, sir. I, I expect to be working nights. And, and where I'm going isn't a suitable place for George. That's why I'm taking him back to his grandmother's. But that's in Salem. What about your work with him? Well, I expect to go to Salem every other day. That's all. I'm sorry, Alec. I ought to have known you better than that. It's all right, Mrs. Sanders. Bell! Hurry, here she comes. Excuse Mr. Me, Bell! I've got to Mr. Go. Bell, here! Take this awful thing! Oh. Where'd I find you? I'll be in time with Watson! That's me! 109 Court Street over the Williams Electric Company! How much slower are you going to take with that? 
I'm ready now. We can try it again. Honest, I know it's genius. I'm just a plain, ordinary man. I like to sleep. I live like a human being. But can I know I've got to sit around day after day, night after night, wasting away, tapping a little piece of metal? I can remember when I used to know pretty girls. I must have been in another world. Mumbling. We may be on the verge of a great discovery. As long as I can remember, we've been on the verge of a great discovery. Look here, I, I can only find four new springs. I thought I told you to get five. I'm sure I told you to get five. I remember now you had just enough money to pay for them. Five new springs at 25 cents each. Now, where is that other spring? I ate it. You did what? I didn't mean to. I was going along and I... I saw that food in the window. Suddenly I got such a craving I couldn't stand it. I went by twice. I tried not to go in, but... I couldn't help it. I was hungry. I can't go on living forever with... So you ate one of my springs. You took the last 25 cents we had to fill your miserable little stomach. Yes, I did. I told you I'm no genius. I'm through starving. I'll go out to the Indian Territory, live on buffalo steak, and you or nobody else will stop. Wait! Wait, don't hold the thing! Don't touch it! As much my money as yours, I had... Show me! Show me! What, what did you do? Do? I didn't do anything. But you did something. I saw it. I heard it. Well, the spring stopped vibrating. I... Just plucked it, that's all. But I heard a sound, a full musical note with overtones. Through the wire. Show me everything you did. Well, this, this contact screw got stuck. Making a permanent contact with the spring? Yes, uh, I just snapped it. While the, while the circuit remained unbroken? I suppose so. Then that strip of magnetized steel was generating its own current. Do it again. No, wait. No, wait. Wait a minute, wait. All right, do it now. It works! It works! It works! I heard it again! Hey, what are you, an Indian? Sure, didn't you know? The Six Nations took me in. Well, that makes it all right, then. Don't, don't you understand? We've accidentally found the undulating current that I've been looking for. For the first time in the history of the world, we've sent sound through a wire. For the first time, nothing. Why, this has happened to nearly every electrician. What you mean is it's the first time the right man has heard it and know what it meant. Is that true? Why, certainly. If you knew anything about electricity, you wouldn't have paid any attention to it. Well, anyhow, I was there. That's the important thing. Just think, we started to work on a telegraph, and now we're on the trail of the electric telephone. Telephone? What's that? It's an apparatus for transmitting the voice. It, it means sound from afar. Here, here, hold this. Hey, where are you going? What, going? Going to tell to tell Mabel, of course. Telephone. Oh, Mr. Bell. Where's Miss Mabel? She's upstairs, sir. I'll tell her you're here. Oh, well, would you please put the gas up in the parlor, sir, while I tell Miss Mabel you're here? Ask her to hurry, please. It's awfully important. Very good, sir. Mabel. Alec, what is it? Mabel, I, I've just discovered the mo... Mabel. Now we can get married. What? Will you marry me? Hurry, tell me. Yes. You will? Of course, Alec. Oh, thank you. I, I never had any other intention. Oh, no, no, not you. Alec, 
Aren't you going to tell me you love me? Oh, please. I want to hear you say it. I love you, darling. It's so dark in here, I can't see. And I'll say it. I love you. Again. I love you. Oh, don't say a word. Don't move. Don't even breathe. I want to remember this moment all my life. Just as it is. I forgot what, what I came here to tell you. My telephone. I've got it. I found a way to talk through a wire. Alan, you haven't. That's why I asked you to marry me. You wait here. I've got to tell your father. No, no, no. No, no Alec, he's, he's reading, and maybe you better wait. Not me. You tell your mother and the girls. I'll handle him. The... Oh. Just a moment, Mr. Bell. I always allow myself 30 minutes with the classics every evening. In the past 40 years, I dare say, I haven't missed three such evenings, except perhaps on my honeymoon. Habit. Habit, Mr. Bell, is the important thing. Setting a regular time for everything and sticking to it. Yes, sir, but, but listen... Too many I... young people today are inclined to postpone to shift and dodge and put off. My father always said, people were prepared to make any effort the day after tomorrow. But when it comes to doing a thing today, <laughs> that's another matter. Have a cigar. No, no, thank you. I, I just want to... Go on, go on, smoke it. There's nothing like a good cigar to help settle your stomach. Now, Mr. Bell, you wanted to see me? Yes, sir. Mabel and I can get married now. Sit down, Mr. Bell. This afternoon, I made a very valuable discovery. I actually sent sound through a wire, without the use of batteries. You what? Before long, I'll be able to send speech, talk from any distance. Before how long? Well, I don't know. But I I'm sure I'll make a telephone someday. Telephone, huh? What about your telegraph? Oh, I'm, I'm going to give that up. This is much bigger and, and newer. Has my daughter accepted you? Yes, sir. And she loves me, too. Mr. Bell, when I married the lady you proposed to make your mother-in-law, I was earning $4,000 a year. In addition, I had certain prospects from my father which promised ample security for my wife and children. May I ask what prospects you have? Well, I haven't any prospects. Unless it's the telephone. Mr. Bell, I'd like to call your attention to a few peculiarities which I've observed about your character. Oh, I... I know I'm not worthy of her, sir. In the first place, I'd say you are emotionally unstable. You jump from one enthusiasm to another with reckless abandon. To begin with, it was the multiple telegraph that consumed your time and energies. Now, you tell me, you're no longer interested in the telegraph, but have gone skipping off in pursuit of some new proposition. But, Mr. Hubbard... Mr. Bell, you may waste your own time if you please, but the sooner you stop wasting my money, the better. I won't give this up. I can't. In that case, disabuse your mind of the idea of marrying my daughter. But, Mr. Hubbard, we, we love each other. Nevertheless, you are not to come here again, Mr. Bell, or even attempt to see my daughter. Not so long as you persist in this folly. Furthermore, if you propose to give up a possibly profitable venture for an air castle, you needn't expect any more support from me. I wash my hands of the whole business. But, Mr. Hubbard, mm, I'm... Twelve after eight. I should have been well past Harvard Square by now. Would you like to accompany me on my constitutional, Mr. Bell? The night air is very refreshing. No, thank you. Well, good night. Oh. 
Now take this little egg. I'd crack it, I'd drop it tenderly into the grease. It quivers and is still. Result? Hunger. But take this same little egg. I leave it to nestle tenderly and lovingly under its mother's breast. Snug and warm. Soon it becomes flesh and feathers. Then it too is dropped tenderly into the grease. Again it quivers and is still. Result? A feast. Listen to me, my fine friend. If I'm going to stand over a hot stove night after night, you can't expect me to live on half an egg. Go on, fall apart. I'm sick of you. I'm sick of the very thought of you. Hey. That's what I think of the hours, the months we've wasted on that stupid idea. You say you're tired. You're hungry. Well, so am I. I want to live like other men just as much as you do. I want a decent bed to sleep in, de decent food to eat. I'm in love. I want to get married. And I will. And if I ever have a child that, 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 that so much as looks at a piece of copper wire or, or mentions electricity, I'll... What about all your work, your plans? It's all done. How much were you getting at the Williams Electric Company? Three dollars a day? Why? Better see if the job is still open, though. I won't be needing you anymore. You're quitting? Yes, I'm going back to teaching the deaf. If I ever decide to work on the telegraph, I'll do it in my spare time. And the telephone? Uh, it was just an air castle. Does Mabel know about this? No. I'm going to write her now. You got any paper? Where'd we get any paper? This will do. What's the date? June 11th. See, Alan. I know, dear. I know what you've been through this past month. No, I mean now. I've got to go to him. Come on. Mabel, to his room? Have you gone out of your Mother, head? I can't help it. I must see him now, today, this minute. Oh, my child. What would your father say? Mother, my eyes are closed. I'm not listening to you. Oh, please, you've got to go with me. I've got to see him. But, Alec, you can't give up your telephone just because Father says so. That'd be criminal. I know what I want, and I've made up my mind to have it. Perhaps Alec is right, dear. Oh, Mother, why do you say that? You know he's not right. But after all, you two love each other. Isn't that enough? It is for me. Well, it isn't for me. Alec, if you give up your telephone, I... I promise I'll never marry you. Maybe. I mean it, Alec. Child, child, it's what up are you to you. Saying? Mabel, I'll never fail you again. Never. Oh, Alec. So was I. 
I was thinking now I've got to make a telephone. I've got to find a receiver. Some way to get speech. If I don't, I'll be just as badly off as I was before she came here. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we should invent the telephone? And it turned out to be the very thing that could make her hear. If you had any imagination or knew anything about sound, you'd know that can't happen. How do you know? You aren't God. I know because in the human ear, when vibrations strike against the eardrum, they cause tiny bones in the back of the head to oscillate. But in Mabel's case, the nerve current in the back of those bones has been permanently injured. Even if sound waves cause the bones to oscillate, cause the bones to oscillate. Oscillate? Oscillate. Undulate. St. Vitus Day? No, no, the ear. What ear? This, this, the ear we hear with. Come on, come on, get up. We, we've got to get an ear, a human ear, and, and, and study it. it. It may give us just what we need for our receiver. You're crazy. Where are you going to get a human ear? Well, I, I'll sharpen my razor, and you go out. Huh? And, never mind, never mind. We'll, we'll get an ear somehow. And maybe, maybe this time, just think, out of Mabel's deafness, we make the whole world hear. Yeah, I know, but an ear, a human ear, you can't do that. We'll use the same principle as the ear exactly. Only we'll use gold beater skin instead of membrane and, and a small piece of metal in front of an electromagnet instead of the bones. And, and we'll use more batteries. That's what we gotta have. More batteries. Yeah, it's gonna take a lot of money. Gold beater skin, batteries, acids. We'll get them somehow. Maybe you could get another advance for Mr. Sanders. No, no, I gotta figure some other way. I've had three advances from him already for less and less work with George. We could both of us go back to work for a little while. Be nice to eat again for a change, too. No, no, that's, that's not the way. We've gotta find a cheaper place to live. Cheaper than this? Certainly. What? I wouldn't stay here even, even if they let us use the shop. It, it's, it's too noisy, too dangerous. There, there are too many people about. We're not going to tell anybody what we're doing. Yet. We'll starve. Maybe you will. Not me. Not until I've made the telephone. Charming place, such atmosphere. Boiled cabbage and flat beer, I'd say. Oh, it's you. Well, don't forget, Mr. Bell, this is for lodgings only. If you think you're going to get any food without paying for it, you got another thing coming. Understand? Lady, we only eat at the Parker House. Will that? Uh... Fifty cents be all right? Merry Christmas, sir. Merry Christmas. Turkey's twelve and a half cents a pound. Extra fine. I'll make them back for one later on. Yes, sir. Right now, I'll have a half a pound of cheese and two apples. Very good, sir. Sure you don't want this? No, I've had all I want. 
Apples and cheese, cheese and apples. And apples and cheese. What's the matter? I don't know. Everything went black in front of me. I feel sort of dizzy. Maybe I better lie down for a few minutes. Well, you lied. You haven't eaten. I didn't. I didn't think I was hungry. Now you stay on the bed. I'm going out and get something to eat. If I'm not back in 15 minutes, you know I got caught. If you see anything with an ear on it, bring it back, please. How about our landlady? Ah, stomachs are funny things. They gnaw at you and growl like a lion when you neglect them. Fill them up again, they settle down and purr just like a kitten. Sure nobody saw you? I saw him chasing the cat, so I expect I'm safe enough. <gasps> oh, that these cigars were sort of a nice afterthought. I had my heart set on a plum pudding where I couldn't find it. We should found a well-done battery with acid oozing all out of it. Well, we can't sit here all day. Let's get to work. On Christmas Eve? Well, what's the matter with Christmas Eve? Well, Christmas may not mean anything to you, but it does to me. I'm not moving. I'm going to sit right here and belt till morning. Sanders, it's only you. Come, come in. Merry come Christmas, Alex. Merry Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas. My sleigh's downstairs. Get your coats on right away. You're spending Christmas at my place in Salem. Christmas with you? That's right. We've got a long drive ahead of us, so hurry up. Oh, but we can't. I, I planned a lot of work for today, and I... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Forget it. It's just what I needed. Come on, let's go. <laughs> If this isn't the devil, 365 days in the year and our only two square meals come on the same day. <laughs> Mr. Watson. Merry Christmas, Mr. Watson. And now, don't balk, young man. I'm going to kiss you, too. Sure, Mrs. Sanders. I'm sort of a flirt myself. <laughs> Alec, I have a surprise for you. For me? You couldn't come to see me. So Mr. Sanders arranged this. Papa thinks we're in church, poor dear. Maybe there is a Santa Claus after all. Alec. Come in. Come in, everybody, and get warm. While I get some blackberry wine. Very good, and very then we grown very up very and very open our packages before supper. Don't. I can't wait another minute. <laughs> and this young lady came out here with her arms loaded down with presents for everybody. Especially you. <laughs> you shouldn't have done that. I haven't anything this year for anybody. Oh, it's nothing. Really, Alec. Was the short and poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. No that, that little fellow looks like George, doesn't he? Can I see George for a moment? Yes, of course. He'd be expecting you on 
Christmas Eve. Mabel, I'm going to... You're going to do what? You watch what we've been up to. Mr. Watson, won't you have a cookie? Now, don't tell me you have a bird's appetite. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Vultures. <laughs> Nelly, uh, take some cookies outside to the children, please. Oh, Alec, you mustn't take him out there, not tonight. Oh, think of his presence, the tree in Santa Claus. I don't understand this, Alec. You didn't have a Christmas present for anyone. Well, thanks to Mr. Sanders, now we have acids and batteries. You go on in the other room and listen while I do the talking. Even if it worked, you couldn't hear me after all the talking I've done. Mm. 
Ahoy, Mr. Watson. Are you there? I now have water in the transmitter cup. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Ahoy, Mr. Watson. Can you hear me now? This is Alexander Bell speaking to you from 5 Exeter Place on March 10th, 1876. Ahoy! Ahoy! Mr. Watson! Come here, I want you. That's right. Well, what did you do? I put two drops of sulfuric acid in the water. That made the water a conductor for the electric current transmitting the voice. Hooray! Oh, hooray! We're in the telephone business now. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh, my leg. Stop howling. You gotta do something about that burn. Oh, but I've, I've got to tell Mabel first. Oh, no, you don't. You sit down and take your britches off. I get some lard. But I, I've got to tell Mabel. I might have known something like this would happen, leaving a lot of acids around you. Ladies and gentlemen, now that the telephone is an accomplished fact, it gives me great pleasure to, to demonstrate its practical use in, in the social and business world. Uh, in a moment, my associate, Mr. Thomas Watson, will, will speak to you from the city of Boston, 20 miles away. Uh, for, the, for the benefit of the audience, additional receivers have been placed at strategic points throughout the hall. Ahoy, Mr. Watson. This is Alexander Graham Bell speaking to you from Salem. Can you hear me? Hoy, Mr. Bell. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to address you this evening. Although I am in Boston and you're in Salem. That's the fun one. <laughs> Thank 
Yankee Doodle came to town riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his cap and called it Sweet Genevieve. by a cornet solo. special treat for you tonight. There is a lady present and is going to speak to you. The first woman's voice ever to be heard publicly over the telephone. Say something in here quick. All I've got to say is this. If you and Mr. Bell don't stop this foolishness, say you have. Out you go. <laughs> 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 How dare you laugh at him? What right have you to this? It's wonderful. Well, I only laugh because I thought he... Please, please. He's laughing at Alec. Well, he better not be. <laughs> and that, that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our demonstration this evening. Anyone desiring further information will kindly step up here and, and leave his name. <laughs> What makes it talk, Father? It's just a plain hollow wire. You talk into it at one end, and naturally the voice comes out at the other. Very amusing evening, Mr. Bell. Imagine putting one of those things in your home and expecting your wife to use it. <laughs> Edward, you really think there's nothing to it? Gardner, in my opinion, the telephone will never be anything more than a toy. You won't put any of your money into it or advise your friends to do so? I shall urge all my friends they have nothing to do with it. Thanks. I just wanted Mr. Bell to have your opinion. Good night. Good night, Good night Gardner. Mr. Good, Good night, Mr. Bell. Bell. Good, Good night, Mrs. Hubbard. Good night, Miss Hubbard. Wasn't it all right, Alec? Well? Mr. Hubbard is one of my partners. Will you see that the necessary papers are drawn up for the New England Telephone Company? Did I understand you to say partners, Mr. Bell? You and Mr. Sanders put up all the money for my experiments. It's only fair that you should share in the returns. But I have no right in this. I never put any money in your telephone. The money I gave you was for your telegraph. I'm not asking you for any money, sir. All you've got to do is help me incorporate. I've already talked to the Williams Company about manufacturing our telephones. Watson and I can install them. And I suppose the next thing, you'll be wanting us to wire every house and public building in the country? We might have to do that, too, eventually. Mr. Bell? Tomorrow morning, Sanders and I are going to have our heads examined just for standing here listening to such nonsense. Good night. Come on, Sanders. In the meanwhile, we better start looking over our assets. It, it looks as if we're in the telephone business now. If he doesn't have apoplexy before morning, he'll come along. If we both don't have apoplexy, Serious, your father calling me here. I'm afraid it is. I didn't need any supper. Oh, Mr. Bell, come in. Sit down. Thank you, sir. Good evening, Mrs. Hubbard. Good evening, Mr. Alex. Bell. I have here an itemized account of the expenses I've incurred in connection with your telephone during the past year. 
To my amazement, I find that I'm involved to the extent of $7,017, against which, as assets, I can count only 207 telephone installations at a net rental loss of $621. Now, what I want to know is, what are you going to do about it? I have that all figured out, sir. I'm going to England. England? Yes, sir. I've had a letter from Sir William Thompson, one of the greatest scientists in England. You know, the man who made the transatlantic cable possible. He says he's heard about the telephone, that there's a great deal of interest in it over there. If I go over there, he feels sure he can arrange a demonstration before Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria? Yes, darling. He says if the Queen will install telephones in the palace, then the whole world will follow suit, just as they'd copy your hats. Why, Alec, that's a splendid idea. Of course they will. May I ask who's going to pay for this pilgrimage? Well, sir, I felt that as long as you and Mr. Sanders already have so much money involved, you'd be willing Mr. to... Mr. Bell, I used to call you a fool. I apologize. You're a genius. I'm the fool. But, Mr. Young Hunter, man, you have a blissful disregard for money. That may be an enviable asset to a genius, but not to a business partner. Oh, but, uh, Father, I, I'm sure we can manage somehow. Did you say we? Mabel. Uh, Mabel. Yes, Papa. I'm going with him. You are what? Alec, I can't let you go 3,000 miles away from me. Mabel. Father, we've waited long enough. If Alec goes to England, I'm going with him. You will take me with you, won't you? You don't think I'd go without you, do you? Oh, darling. Mabel. Father, my eyes are closed. Mr. Bell, will you stop this? Gardner, she's right. You've kept these young people apart long enough. Mother. Oh, my goodness. Oh, what have I said? Let me do it for you. I don't know why I must be so clumsy. Oh, oh, you're, you're choking me. They'll, they'll hang you for that. This is England. They hang you over here even for killing a mere husband. Dear darling, I think that looks all right. You know, Victoria may be queen of the British Empire and Ireland and anywhere else she chooses. But she's also a woman. And what's more, she's a widow. But a rich widow. Don't forget that. Mm -hmm. And she has ladies in waiting, too. Been waiting for handsome young men like me? Well, Alec, I, I'm just warning you. Can't I even wink at her just once? Oh, darling, I don't care if the Queen kisses you. Just as long as she puts telephones in her palace. Perhaps she will. Tonight is our night. And we can pay all of your ex-landladies all the money you owe them. <laughs> and Watson can eat himself into the gout. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Bell can have all the time he wants to make love to his wife. There isn't that much time. Darling. Oh, great heavens, what, what am I thinking about? I, I mustn't keep the queen waiting. Alec. Good luck. Thank you, dear. Oh, please let Victoria want a telephone. For my Alec. Sir William Thompson tells us that your telephone is a marvelous instrument, Mr. Bell. Sir William is, is very kind, Your Majesty. Is this the device? Yes, ma'am. There, there's a similar instrument in Osborne Cottage where Sir Thomas Bidoff is waiting to hear Your Majesty's voice. You expect me to speak into that? If, if Your Majesty would be so, so gracious. I think you had better speak into it. After all, one does not converse with a wire. Beatrice, Major Phipps, come closer. Listen. If, if you please, ma'am, we're ready to begin. You may proceed. Sir Thomas Bidoff? Yes, I'm here. That is Sir Thomas's voice. Ask him the time. Sir Thomas, Her Majesty wishes to know the time. Tell Her Majesty to know exactly three minutes past time. I think I will speak into it after all. Sir Thomas, 
Your watch is two minutes slow. Set it. Thank you, Your Majesty. I will do so immediately. Sir William, you were right. This is a marvelous invention. General, we will have Mr. Bell's telephone installed in Buckingham Palace. Yes, Your Majesty. Oh, it, it will be an honor, ma'am. The Americans are a very inventive people. Mr. Bell was born in Edinburgh, Your Majesty. He went to Canada several years ago and then to America. The Scots are very inventive, too. Now have it say something else, Mr. Bell. She likes it. She wants telephones at Buckingham Palace. Yes, darling, I knew she would. Tomorrow the court calendar will carry the news, and the day after the whole world will know it's fashionable to talk through a wire. Alec, wait a minute. This just came tonight from Father. What is it? What is it? Here. I'll read it to you. Dear child, your mother and I hesitate to cast a cloud on your happiness, but no longer can we hide from you the terrible things that are going on here. Ever since your marriage, there's been nothing but trouble. A new telephone company, known as the American Speaking Telephone Company, has been organized with a Western Union company backing, and has entered the field against us with their own instrument, which they advertise as the product of the original inventors, meaning Doe, Bear, Gray, and others. They boast that their telephone is infinitely superior to Alex. They've got everybody afraid even to deal with us. Cancellations are pouring in. We had hoped to spare you this, at least until Alex had seen the Queen. But there's... But that is no longer possible. Unless a miracle happens to save us, Sanders and I stand to lose all. Our homes, our credit, everything. Your loving but despairing father. What are you going to do? Do? I fight them, of course. Fight them tooth and nail with, with everything we've got. Of course we will, darling. Of course. Superior, is it? Superior to mine, hmm? We'll go home on the first boat. Yes. We'll show them. Maybe we are poor. Maybe my telephone is still crippled and, and lame. No, Ellie. Maybe, maybe it is still, still in want. But it's part of my blood and brains. It's mine, all mine. And they'll never take it away from me. It's my child. It's your other child, Alec. Why, I... <laughs> Just one thing after another. <laughs> Ahoy. You'll have to speak louder, please. Mrs. Crow would like to speak, Mr. Blackford. Just a moment, please. Go ahead. Ahoy. Clear 70. Sorry, no more credit from the banks. They gave me back the telephone stock I put up for that last loan. Said they preferred my personal note. The Williams Company say they can't manufacture another telephone unless they get hold of some money. At the rate cancellations are coming in, we won't need them. What's worrying me is, how are we going to meet this week's payroll? I forgot to tell you, we've hired Theodore Vale as our general manager. What? And Francis Blake's working on a transmitter that'll stand up with theirs any day. Mr. Hubbard thinks Vale is the best man in the country for the job. It was really your idea. Well, I must say you've got nerve. And another thing, tomorrow we're bringing suit against the American-speaking telephone company charging infringement on our patents. 
We're going to fight a $40 million concern, the Western Union. We're going to fight every company in the country infringing on our patents. What else can we do? But look at the odds against us. They've got the best lawyers money can buy. If we lose, the court costs alone will wipe us out. Well, that's a chance we'll have to take. Well, there's an old saying, sell all you have and give to the poor. If you think it has any application in this case, I still have an old farm up in Maine that, uh... I knew I could count on you. Well, I was too young for the Civil War, but this looks like as good a fight as any to me. Thanks, Tom. We'll probably see plenty of action. Just what are you going to fight with? The truth. Well, son, that's always been a pretty good weapon. Perhaps more people ought to use it. Proceed. Your Honor, it has not been the intention of my clients to burden this court with wordy debates. We have endeavored to confine ourselves to the facts. First, that Alexander Bell was not the first to invent the telephone. Second, that the patents under which the New England Bell Telephone Company have been operating were fraudulently obtained. And third, we have defied the plaintiff to show that Mr. Bell had been working on the undulating current feature of the telephone prior to February the 14th, 1876, at which time, by strange coincidence, both he and Mr. Gray informed the Patents Office uh, simultaneously of their work on the telephone. Very well. Counsel may proceed. Mr. Bell, what is your occupation? I'm a teacher of the deaf. Are you an American citizen? Yes, sir. An American citizen by choice. I see. Now, Mr. Bell, have you any proof to give us that you were working on the uh, undulatory feature of the telephone prior to February 1876? Only my word and the word of my friends. Not a notebook? Not a little scrap of paper? Not even a pencil mark on a wall? Nothing? No, sir. I didn't have time to record my findings. I see, Mr. Bell. Very convenient. You uh, have heard, of course, that not one, but five other men were working along similar lines prior to February 1876. That's what I've been told in this courtroom. Oh, come, come, Mr. Bell. Are you trying to impeach our witnesses? Have you any proof that they were not so engaged? No, sir. But I repeat, I was working on my system early in 1875, and that I first produced sound through a wire on June 2nd of that same year. And that on March 10th, 1876, a human voice, mine, was heard through a wire for the first time in history. Mr. Bell, I have here certain sheets of paper which you have identified as rough drafts of your patents application. Do these correspond with your final patents application? No, sir. Why not? I wrote and rewrote those specifications a great many times. Those sheets are mere fragmentary remains that happen to be accidentally preserved. Mm. Well, I don't see any mention of the undulating current in this uh, rough draft, as you call it. Those statements were added as I completed and redrafted my application. Mr. Bell, could those specifications have been added after you had filed your application? Certainly not. I mean, could you have gained illegal access to the Patents Office and copied into your application certain paragraphs from a paper or a caveat that had been filed the same day as your patent application? Your question is insulting. I refuse to hear it. Answer me, sir. Did you connive to steal the basic principle of your telephone? Yes or no? I have only contempt for such a question. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Your Honor, I protest against the tactics of some of our opponents. In the name of decency and fair play, I protest against Mr. Barrow's foul insinuations. Your Honor, I'm sorry that my learned colleague is so thin-skinned. 
All we ask of Mr. Bailey is that he produce one single bit of legal proof, one memorandum, one scrap of paper proving his contentions of priority. But will he? No. Can he? No. And why not? Because, Your Honor, he hasn't any proof. None exists. Mr. Bell, this court desires to afford you every opportunity to establish your claims. If you have any proof, I shall expect you to have it here Monday morning. Until then, this court stands adjourned. Court adjourned. Are you sure you have no papers, no sketches, nothing? Nothing that I know of. What are you going to do? I've done all I can do. I'm going home. Home? You can't do that. I've heard all of this I want to hear. I'm going to be with Mabel when our baby is born. But, Alec, it may be weeks yet. You can't be certain about the first baby. I'm sorry, I'm going. At least let me telegraph and find out when you'll be needed. Alec, stay. If you leave now, I can promise you, you'll lose. Mother and I are leaving immediately. Don't dare leave trial. Is that all right? Yes, that's fine, dear. Uh-uh. Uh, would you send this for me, please? Uh, would you care to add the word love, madam? That'll make it exactly ten words. Yes. Yes, make it love, Mabel. Shades of glory. Is this man to be allowed to control a great public benefaction? Permitted to foist an inferior article on the public? Just to gratify his egotism? Your Honor, I submit that the only invention to which our friend is undeniably entitled is the invention of the story that he was working on the undulatory current prior to February 1876. Order. To Order that is in welcome. Take your seat, please. Mabel, what are you doing here? I couldn't bear the thought of your leaving. I had to come. But at a time like this, it, it's dangerous. Oh, no, darling, I'm all right. And Alec, Alec, I found this. It might be the very evidence you're looking for. Evidence? Evidence? Yes. Do you remember this? It's a letter that you wrote to me in June, 1875. And Alec, you say in this letter that you're going to give up your work on the telephone. Let me see it. Silence in the court, please. Your Honor. Mrs. Bell has just brought us the proof the defense has been asking for. Documentary evidence that Alexander Bell discovered the undulating current on which his telephone was based prior to June 1875. Very well, Mr. Smith. If you have such evidence, present it. I beg your honor's indulgence for just one moment. I'd rather that letter weren't presented. Alec. That is something between you and me. It's part of our personal lives. But Alec, but it's your proof. I'm sure there's nothing in this letter to be ashamed of. I'd rather not do it. I regret to inform your honor, Mr. Bell declines to submit the new evidence. What did he say? Alec won't let him present the letter. Alec, for the first and, and I hope the only time in my life, I'm going to disobey you. It's my letter and I'm going to read it. Maybe. I won't stand by and see you called a liar and a thief. But darling... Alec, my eyes are closed. It's dated June the 11th. 1875, and was written to me by Mr. Bell before our marriage. Will you read it, please? I beg your pardon. Will you read it, please? My dearest one, I have loved you with a passionate attachment that you cannot understand. That is, to me, new and incomprehensible. Ever since I held you in my arms and kissed your lips, I have known what I want most in life. Without you, I am nothing. With you, I am complete. Because this is so, I have decided to give up my telephone. This is little enough to do if it means that I will have your arms about me forever. If I may call you sweetheart and... wife. Go on, Mrs. Bell. Please don't grieve at my decision. The telephone will be born someday, somehow, and so far as I am concerned, I do not care one bit who gets the glory, so long as the world gets the benefit. 
with all my heart. I am yours. Thank you, Mrs. Bell. Your Honor, may I suggest that this court is not interested in the sentiments, uh, however tenderly expressed, that we've just heard? What possible bearing has a love letter on whether Bell invented the telephone or did not invent it? The mere mention of a telephone does not mean that he made a telephone. Mrs. Bell, what kind of paper is that letter written on? Why, it's on ordinary wrapping paper. What is that on the back of it? Why, well, it's uh, drawings of apparatus Mr. Bell wanted for his telephone, together with a stamped acknowledgement from the Williams Electric Company, acknowledging receipt of the order on June the 3rd, 1875. What is that writing? Mr. Williams scribbled a note at the bottom of the page asking Mr. Bell to stop in and verify his outlaying of an apparatus to generate an undulating current. That is all. You may step down, Mrs. Bell. Thank you. Just a moment, Mrs. Bell. Will you please tell us why Mr. Bell sent you a love letter on the back of a sales memorandum? Why didn't he use note paper, as any young man in love would be expected to do? Mr. Bell was a very poor man. He had no other paper on which to write. Thank you, Mrs. Bell. You may step down. I offer this letter in evidence as Exhibit 17 to the plaintiff. Your Honor, I'm sure we've all been touched by this little uh, excursion into romance. But now, if we may compose ourselves, I'd like to ask why, if such a letter existed, it wasn't produced days ago. And more particularly, why my learned colleague hasn't produced the man Williams in court to substantiate his signature. Unfortunately, Mr. Williams is no longer available as a witness. Oh, really now? And why not? Surely it would be worth your while to bring Mr. Williams here. Let us have a look at him. Mr. Williams is dead. Oh, he's dead. How very unfortunate, Mr. Bell. Now, very convenient. Your Honor, without my knowledge and against my wishes, my wife came into this courtroom at a time like this, to read to you a letter intended for her eyes alone. Have I committed some offense by starving in an attic? By spending sleepless nights at my work? By being too poor to own a decent scrap of paper on which to tell her of my love? I have sat here for days and heard myself called liar, thief, fraud, and cheat. I've seen my friends humiliated my invention belittled, just as I have seen my business destroyed by methods which must leave every honest man appalled. Your Honor, we protest against this interruption. Yes, but yes, yes, haven't yes. we had enough of this sentimental nonsense? I demand that this man be declared in contempt of court. Mr. Barrows, we're all here in the interest of truth. And I don't think Mr. Bell can do that any great injury. Sit down, Mr. Barrows. Gentlemen, I am no longer fighting the battle of Alexander Graham Bell, inventor of the telephone. That man, however just his suit, does not matter here. The issue is bigger, bigger than the millions involved. And there are millions at stake, as your guilty cheeks already tell me. Your Honor, we must protest. Protest all you like, gentlemen. I mean to say what I have to say. The time is coming when the telephone will be known in every home in the land, in every shop and factory, and beyond the seas, even to the remotest ends of the earth. But that, too, is not the issue. The issue is simply this. Shall the lonely scientist, the man who dreams, and out of his dreams benefits the world, is he, that often half-starved, lonely little man, to be told the world has no need of him the moment his work is done? You're right. Oh, is he to be told that others, less gifted but stronger,
men with money and power behind them are waiting to take the product of his genius and turn it to their own uses, leaving him with liar and thief branded on his brow as his only reward? Do that, and you stop the clock of progress. You smother the spark of genius that lies hidden here and there throughout the world. Do that, and the world stands still. Your Honor, I demand that this man be cited in contempt of court. Put him down, Mr. Barrett. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. This case is under advisement. Mabel, are you all right? Alec, I'm afraid. We must get her out of here quickly. Get her, Nick. Get an ambulance, quick. An ambulance is not one within 20 blocks of here. They got a telephone, though, if you know how to use it. Telephone? Hold her, Mother. Show me where it is, quick. This way. Watson, come here, I want you. Go get an ambulance, quick. Ahoy! Ahoy! This is Alexander Graham Bell speaking. I want an ambulance. Hurry, Watson. This fool thing will never work. Oh. Ahoy! Ahoy! Here she is, pretty as a picture. <laughs> Hello, Anisha. Oh, look. I think she knows me. <laughs> I'm sure she does, dear. Would you like to hold her? Who, me? Hmm? Oh, you, you know how clumsy I am. Yes, I would. Oh. There you are, darling. Be careful of her back. <laughs> you know, you haven't told me a word about the trial since I came home. Well, they still have it under advisement. Which probably means we've lost. Alec, would you mind so terribly? One can't work and struggle and not care when it all goes for nothing. Especially when there are others involved. Your father, Mr. Sanders, Watson. But... You know what? I've been thinking about something else. Alec, Mabel, your father, Mr. Sanders, and Mr. Watson are here, and someone else. May they come in? Why, of course, Mama. Here, darling, I'll take her. How's my little girl? Alec, you know Mr. Pollard? I'm the president of the Western Union. How do you do? My wife and my daughter. Uh, Mrs. Bell, we must apologize for coming here like this, but uh, your father insisted. Go ahead. Break it to them. Well, Mr. Bell, the Western Union is ready to admit that you and you alone invented the telephone. What? We will retire from the field and turn over to you the 56,000 telephones we now have in operation. Alec. Uh, the fact is, we made the mistake of accepting a false report from one of our engineers. After your wife read your letter in court, we made a further investigation. We found that this man, Brazewell, not only intended to deny your rights, but to injure us as well. Mr. Bell, we're not only willing, but anxious to pay for that mistake. Of course, if you'd consider us as partners, we could offer our wires, rights of way, improvements, and other assets. You could. Or shall we say one-fifth interest? Well, I, I don't know what to say. I ought to warn you, you have probably the most valuable single patent ever issued. Your stock was selling on the New York Exchange this morning for a thousand dollars a share. A thousand dollars? Well, what do you say, Alec? Well, I'll have to ask my wife. Well, Alec, you know I never interfere with your business. Gentlemen, I accept. Thank you, Mr. Bell. Yeah, it's exactly eleven and a half minutes past eleven. Time for this young lady's lunch. <sighs> Goodbye, my dear. Papa. Come, gentlemen. It's been a pleasure, Goodbye. Mrs. Bell. Goodbye, Goodbye. Mrs. Bell. Goodbye. Goodbye. Alec. Alec, aren't you happy? Everything you've wanted and worked for. And everything the world has to offer you. Yes, darling. But I, wa I wanted to tell you. I've been thinking about something else. Yes? The other day, I, I saw a seagull flying. And there was, there was something about about the curve of its wings. It just occurred to me that if a bird that's heavier than air can fly, 
A man might fly, too. What did you say? If a bird that's heavier than air can fly, a man might fly, too. A man fly? Yes. When are you going to start work on it, Mr. Bell? 